So back in middle school, we had the misfortune of having to use Chromebooks for class. Those things are so dystopian that I'm convinced there will be an entire generation of kids who will not know how to use actual computers. But anyway, between that, the school's firewall, and YouTube restricted mode being on, there weren't many options in terms of, I'm bo bored at lunch and have no one to sit with, I should play something on this thing. So one day, because I didn't have many options, I booted up Yar's Revenge for the Atari 2600, which was available to play on IGN's website for free at the time. I don't know why I chose it specifically, I think I had just watched Atari Game Over, I don't know, it was a long time ago. For reference, I'm in college now, that's why I'm in this recording booth and I don't have a green screen up. Don't worry though, they've got like plenty of computers. They've got this thing and they've got plenty of computers loaded up with Resolve already, so I'll be fine. Because of this experience, I have knowledge that the Yar series exists. Knowledge that seems to be pretty sparse nowadays. Created by Howard Scott Warshaw in 1982, Yar's Revenge quickly became the best-selling original game for the 2600. That is, a game that isn't an arcade port or a licensed game. But despite that, no one seems to remember it. And very recently, Atari has published a brand new game in the Yar series, Yar's Rising. I am not going to give you any more context for this, this will be your only impression of the game until we get to it. Now my quest to review this series was not spawned by Rising specifically, as the idea has been in the back of my head ever since I started doing reviews. If anything, it was the Steam sale Atari had on during it, PAX, that caused me to make this now, because that was what caught me to realize that we were getting a new Yars game. So because it is totally a slow re release month, and there is nothing else coming out to cover, or, at the very least, nothing else coming out the same week as this new Yars game, let's talk about the series as it is shown on the official timeline on Atari.com. For going the browser games that are now lost media, of course. Also, a uh, fair warning, if you are epileptic or anything, uh, maybe don't watch this video, like, at all. Go watch my 3D Mario video instead. Oh, and before we start, I would like to... Again, I like to full disclaimer, like I did in the 3D Mario video, which version I'm playing. I'll be emulating all of the 2600 games that I can off of the Atari 50 collection, which... I'm sorry, I have to praise this collection for a minute. This might be one of the greatest video game compilations ever created, alright? If... You don't even have to be a Atari fan. Even if you're just a fan of video game history in general, you should pick this up. Because it's less like... In a world where video game compilations are slowly losing all the bonus features they used to have, like concept art, and are now just the games, this game goes in the complete opposite direction, and it's a book first, and a video game collection second. Like, it's like a documentary with games in it. It's so cool. So, highly recommend that. Just had to show that collection, it's so good. Anyway. The main complaint I found in my research about this game is that people don't know what's happening. Those people clearly didn't ma read the manual or the comic book, which outline it completely. I have read the manual and comic book, so allow me to explain. You play as an unnamed Yar, a species of fly creatures who evolved from the common housefly after some were accidentally brought to space by us humans. Their main enemy, the, co the Cotile, has a- sorry, it's hard to pronounce- has a ship that is surrounded by an energy field made up of cells. You can break these cells by either shooting them, or nibbling at them one at a time. Once there is an opening in the field, you have to summon the Zorlong Cannon by either devouring a cell or running over the Cotile, at which point it will appear on the left. You now have to fire it at the Cotile to blow it up and cause a very technically impressive explosion, like wow, this is why I had epileptic people leave, I don't think they can handle this. The cannon will follow your movement until you fire it, so you have to line it up yourself, which can be tricky since the Cotile also often moves. There are two levels, this basic one, and one where all of the cells move in this square. And your objective is to simply destroy as many Kotiles as you can and rack up points. The Kotile will put up a fight though. It has two ways of attacking you. There is a single, ever-present bullet that will slowly home in on you, and the Kotile will sometimes turn into a swirl and launch itself at you. Also, the Zor Zorlon Cannon will hurt you if you don't get out of its path, so make sure to do that after firing it. You can avoid damage from the bullet by hovering in the neutral zone, which is act this rainbow force field in the middle, which is actually apparently the remains of a planet the Kotile destroyed. However, you can still be hit by the swirl in there, so be careful. There's a couple of alternate game modes too. The game says there's eight, but half of those are two-player versions, so there's more like four. There's a children's mode, which is just easy mode. This was the only one I knew about in middle school, whoops. Normal mode, where the bullet and swirls move a bit faster. There's cannon bounce mode, where the Zorlon cannon will bounce back off the shield if it gets hit and can damage you on the way back, and then there's the ultimate Yar, 
In this mode, you can no longer call this roll on cannon at will. You now need 5 trons to activate it. You can get 1 tron by eating a cell, 2 by running over the co tile, watch for the swirl, and 4 for catching the cannon on its bounce back. The cannon will still hurt you on the way there though. Once you have enough trons, you can touch the very left edge of the screen to fire the cannon as usual. Okay, I'm done with the explanation. So is the game fun? I'd say so. Your movement feels quick and snappy, which is kind of a rarity on this console. It's a little weird how you fly faster horizontally than you do vertically or diagonally, but I can't tell if that's a glitch or if it's intended, because you know you have to like cover more ground that way or something. Now obviously it is a 2600 game, so you're not going to get tens of hours, maybe even five hours of enjoyment out of it, but it's fun enough for what it is. Definitely on the more fun side of Atari 2600 games, most of them are very clunky. Lots of build off potential here. I can't wait to see how Howard Scott Warshot definitely improves it in the inevitable sequel. But first, let's talk about the remakes of this game. First, we have the Game Boy Color version, made by Mike Micah. This is very obscure. I bet all of you who clicked on this video who played Yard's Revenge on the Atari have no idea what this is. In fact, you probably only know about the first game, but I'm getting ahead of myself. The main gameplay loop is the same, so let's talk about the differences. There is a password save system for some reason. I mean, there's only two levels. The only real point is to go for a score. No idea why this exists. There's cutscenes now. That's cool. Even if they're basic, clearly people don't like reading the manual, so it'll help those people at least. There is also now a scrolling screen due to the screen crunch, which sucks. And finally, the best change in my opinion, the Ghost of Yar now leads to a bonus stage. Yeah, so in the original 2600 version, there's actually an easter egg. If you kill the Kotile well in its swirl form, this black line will appear during the explosion. If you stand on it, the game will end, and all the digits of your score will replace with Howard Scott Warshaw's initials twice. Back then, Atari didn't allow dev credits for fear of poaching by other companies, so to stand up to that, the creator of the game Adventure hit his name through the first documented example of an easter egg in a video game. So this falls in a similar vein, unless it's much less cryptic than that game. Anyway, the manual warns about this, calling this the black line the Ghost of Yar, and telling you not to touch it because it will end your game. Which is kind of fair. In this version, the Ghost of Yar can sometimes appear under the same circumstances, but this time if you touch him, you'll be taken to a bonus stage where it's Doomsday Stone. You have to make your way through an asteroid field to run over him as many times as possible for lives. Very cool! But unfortunately, despite the updated graphics and the cool new additions, I still think the original is better because the screen scrolling is just a total buzzkill. It makes the game so much harder. There's also only one difficulty mode, which is Ultimate Yar with no shield bounce, which is also annoying. There's also a ton of lag that wasn't in the original. It definitely is a port done right, as the screen scroll is a necessary evil, and everything else about this port is great. But I prefer the original version every time. Next up is Yar's Revenge Reimagined, also created by Mike Micah. That's cool. Okay, so as part of the Atari 50 collection I praised earlier, there are a bunch of reimagined versions of the games. They are all very original, barely even resembling the source material most of the time. Except, that is, for Yard's Revenge. Yard's Revenge Reimagined is literally the same game with updated graphics. And when I say it's the same game, it literally reuses the source code from the original, so all the imperfections and things are still there. On top of that, I don't think the new graphics are very good. Like, look how bright this is, and this music is just obnoxious. As I said before, the main problem people had with Yard's Revenge is they couldn't tell what's going on, and this doesn't help. You can toggle between these graphics and the original graphics at any time, though. And Mike Micah's initials are now also in the easter egg. I suspect this wasn't as original since Yard's Recharge, which is original, came out the same year. None of the other reimagined games also got the recharge treatment. Or at least I thought they didn't, until I found out that Break Off Breakout got both too! Alright, <laughs> uh, well, time for the sequel that Yard's Revenge surely got, because it was so successful, right? Yeah, so the sequel to Yars Revenge is a bit complicated. There are two games that could technically both be considered the sequel, and neither released during the 2600's initial run. There's Saboteur, a game made by Howard Scott Warshaw that continues the lore of Yars Revenge, but follows a completely separate cast of characters in the Yarniverse. Yeah, that's the official name for it. <laughs> and the other is Yars Return, a homebrew game with Howard Scott Warshaw's blessing that was eventually made official through the Atari Flashback line of plug-and-play consoles. Let's start with Saboteur. So Saboteur is one of those cancelled games that had nothing to do with the game's development itself. Well, kind of like Star Fox 2. Basically, Warner Bros, who owned Atari at the time, converted the game into a game based off the A-Team to meet licensing obligations. So Saboteur 
never released. If you thought Yar's Revenge was complicated, oh boy, this one's a doozy. So, the Kotile are back at it again and are planning to destroy the galaxy using a big rocket with a bomb in it. You're the robot, Hotot, and your objective is to... Hotot? And your objective is to sabotage the rocket launch and... I put Psyarm. Disarm the warheads within. Why did I put Psyarm in the script? What was I thinking? So here's what you gotta do. Level 1 is the launch site. There are Kotile construction robots and enslaved ro Yarflies. Rest in peace, Yar race. I guess they, they just they succumb to the Kotile. That are building the rocket and you have to shoot them down. Along from the master robot at the top because he's the one shooting bullets at you. Occasionally you will see these yellow creatures called the Gorfons. They can steal parts from the rocket and sabotage the launch, but they need time to do so. You need to not kill them by accident. So you have to shoot all the construction robots in the yards you see, but not the Gorfons. This is easier said than done, but you'll know if you successfully sabotage the rocket if you get a big point bonus. Next up is level 2, the Warhead Assembly. Now Hot Hotot must disarm the warhead that is being built. There's a master robot in the middle of the field, and a bullet that bounces around. Any shots you shoot that here will home into the master robot, then fall down to the bottom of the screen to destroy any of the warhead parts, warhead parts on this conveyor belt. You have 30 seconds to destroy all the warhead parts. Also, if you are unsuccessful in stopping the rocket launch, there will be two bullets here, and they will be faster. If you are able to destroy all the parts of the warhead, congratulations. The rocket will explode, and you'll be ready for the next loop. If you didn't, you'll move on to stage 3. Here, you just have to shoot the rocket once. That's it. There are plenty of bullets on screen, but you only need to shoot the rocket once. Doing so, it cause it will explode to save the galaxy. Failure will doom the galaxy in its entirety. Whatever the outcome, the game will loop after this level. I do not like Saboteur as much. It's impressive the amount of gameplay variety HSW was able to put into this thing, but I think there's too much. It's fun, sure, and the level of progression is cool, but I like Yars' simplicity more. And Yars was the game that no one could figure out. Imagine how hard it must be for them to play this. Okay, so that was the original script, but since writing it, I think I've been a little too harsh. The objective is not harder to figure out than Yars' Revenge, because in Yars' Revenge everything is super abstract. Here, the in-game sprites look like actual things. Oh, yep, that's a rocket, I can confirm, that is a robot. Not to mention, the game literally tells you what to do at the bottom. Saboteur is probably a better game than Yars' Revenge as a result. I think I was just bad. It was literally just a skill issue that caused my review to be bad. Okay, so next up is Yars Return. As I mentioned, this was initially a homebrew game that was given HSW's blessing, but was later included in the Atari flashback line of plug-in plays. So let's see how it fares, shall we? Wait, where is it? I can't think of a single good reason for this not to be included in Atari 50. At first, I thought the game's complex origins and late release time were to blame, but Adventure 2 and Return to Haunted Houses made it here in a content update, and those have exactly the same circumstances. I then thought that Atari was trying to promote their new XP line of cartridges, which are cartridges for games that never initially released, since they came out as part of the 50th birthday bash. The first three games in the first wave were Saboteur, Yards Return, and Aquaventure. We've already established Saboteur was in here since launch, and Aquaventure was added in the same content update that Adventure 2 and Return to Haunted Houses were. Alright, well, maybe it wasn't deemed relevant enough, but I just didn't want to include it. That doesn't make sense. As, they, as I mentioned, Yars Revenge was the most successful original IP on their flagship console. And, on top of that, the content update came out in December of 2023, and Yars Revenge was revealed just four months later in an Indie World presentation. Yes, Atari is an indie company now. They've got the lack of reviews to prove it. So it was surely in development at that point. You can't tell me that they that's not relevant enough. Hey, well, fine. So it's not in. So what? The ROM is probably super accessible after a Google search. Oh, well, you can find the flashback ROM pretty easily, sure. But that version of the game has many glitches that were patched out in the XP version, which is not findable. So this arguably needs to be included more than anything else. I was also going to make a bit about how you could buy a VCS and buy the ROM off that, that store, but I'm not buying a whole new console. Yes, Atari has a new console just to play one game. But no, apparently that's also the flashback ROM. So what? what is that? What? What? Macs are so weird, man. Listen, Atari, Digital Clips, I'm not mad at you. Atari 50 is one of the greatest video game compilations ever made, so I can't be mad at you. I just have one simple request. I see that you're releasing a major paid DLC expansion to the game collection next month. Very cool, excited for that. Would you also mind adding Yars Return as a free content update, please? I have no idea why it's not included, and it will make the entire series, aside from that one Facebook prequel that has lost media, playable legally to the average consumer. Thank you. 
Okay, time to go play the game. I'll come back when I'm done. Two hours later. This game is a mess. So the gimmick here is that now the shield is dual-sided. The neutral zone wraps all around, and there are now two bullets. The Atari 2600 is not capable of displaying that many cells at a time, of course, so the game uses flickering to display both. What, what that means is every other frame, one side of the shield gets despawned, and the other side sa spawns in. That happens forever. That's why the ghost of the Atari 2600 pack version of Pac-Man flickered like that. You'll probably only see it if you're watching it on 60 FPS on YouTube, so if you aren't, go ahead and change the quality. And this causes heaps of issues. To start, I don't even think the gimmick works that well. The neutral zone covers so much of the screen now that you don't even have any room to shoot anymore. I forgot to mention this in my 2600 review, but you cannot shoot while in the neutral zone. That's why it's called the neutral zone, because neither you nor him can hurt each other. You can barely even launch the Zorlon cannon without flying to the opposite end of the screen. It's very frustrating. And then there's the glitches in this version. Oh boy. Sometimes the Kota will swirl without warning or do it right after the level begins. The neutral zone is just gone on later levels, which might not be a glitch, but it sure seems like it. The Ghost of Yar always appears, but it would never take me to credits land. I'm pretty sure only one of the bullets hurts you. And to top it all off, on all the cannon bounce modes, the cannon will not bounce and instead will cut through the cells like butter. Which destroys the game. Any semblance of challenge is gone now. You just eat one cell, fly to the other side of the, fly to the, other side of the screen, and shoot. Every time. But even if the glitches were fixed, as I said, I think it's too gimmicky. Both of the stages are copy-pasted from Yards 1 too, so there's not even originality in the layout. Look, maybe if I had the fixed ROM, my opinion would change, but as it stands, Yars Return is a sorry excuse for the sequel. I feel bad saying that because it was a homebrew game, but I can't give it special treatment. Guess what, guys? We're finally done with the 2600! Woo! That, that took longer than I thought it would, mainly because I didn't know about Saboteur. I can't wait to see what the funny fly alien looks like on HD consoles. Okay, man, what the H-E-C-K is this? This is Yars, the apostrophe is before the S this time, Revenge, released on Xbox Live Arcade and Steam in 2011. The franchise got completely rebooted and turned Yar into an anime girl, I can't believe this, what? I don't know why they did this, none of the other characters are humanoids. The other Yars kind of, but they still look like aliens. This is just a person with four arms and wings, which is kinda uncanny. Not no, don't know why they did this, it's not even like you can see her during gameplay, so it doesn't really matter, but... It's just weird. Why did I do this? This is an on-rail shooter akin to Panzer Dragoon. You have a normal rapid-fire shot, a laser that charges up, missiles that allow lock-on to multiple enemies, E1, E1 and 2 Gamma style, and various power-ups. Easy to activate the neutral zone to heal you, send out a ball that homes in enemies and kills them, absorbs all projectiles, or makes you fire faster. There's also an ultimate attack you unlock when you reach the final zone, but you kind of do so unceremoniously. The tutorial tells you, you will have this one day, and then you just have it. There's no cutscene or anything where you get it, as far as I can tell. You have to click and hold both sticks for this, by the way. There's also a score multiplier with kind of annoying sound effects, but they're not so bad that you can't get used to them. Oh, and you have a dodgeball, of course. The gameplay should be repetitive, since no new gimmicks are introduced, but I didn't find it to be so. I was pretty engaged the whole time, even if it was pretty bare bones. Also, I'm getting major Halo vibes with this art direction. Is that just me? Please don't tell me that... Please don't tell me that's just a guy who's only ever played Halo a moment. Honestly, the story is probably the best part of this game. It's not amazing or anything, you're not gonna cry, but it's still a lot of thought provoking, I think. I don't know, I liked it. However, one weird thing with the dialogue that Yar is that Yara has a weird thing with pronouns. And no, I'm not saying she's woke or anything. Don't worry, I have extremely woke opinions, and I go to an extremely woke school. I'm not like that. It's that not only does she refer to herself in the third person, but she used the term this one instead of saying I, and instead of saying you, she says that one, or just your name. She speaks very formally too, and she's the only one who does this. Like, look at this dialogue that starts one of the levels. This one grows fond of her armor. Yes, good, well, it's been waiting many years for you. Like, the contrast is insane. Once you get past the weirdness of it all, and accept that this just isn't a traditional Yars game, there's a game here that is good. Enough. It didn't wow me or anything, I haven't played any other on-rail shooter like this, but as I said, this is pretty bare bones. If you want to play this style of this game, you definitely have better options, and I would recommend researching those better options and playing those instead. You'll probably get more than two hours of playtime out of those at least. I could honestly refund the game right now, which would be funny. Oh, wait, actually, it might have been two weeks already, I'm not sure. But I've decided not to because I got it 
on sale for two dollars so like it's not worth it i'll just keep it it's funny for atari's 50th anniversary in addition to releasing that heavenly collection they also released recharged versions of 10 of their most popular games yars was lucky enough to get a spot i mean i guess it's not lucky it's the best-selling original ip of course it's got to get a spot and guys guys they finally did it it took them 30 years, but they finally evolved the traditional Yars gameplay. I can't believe it. The way they did that is simple. Just make it bigger. Co-tile formations are now made up of many, many cells and several guns. In order to summon the Zorlon cannon, you once again have to collect Trons. You need a lot more than five, though. Destroying the guns will drop a lot of Trons, as well as giving you a temporary power-up based on what government has. Nibbling them is faster. Once the cannon appears, you now get to pilot it, you get two large shots, which is the amount of pelf pink co-tiles take the die. However, the Zorlon cannon shots are also much better at destroying cells. This is a very fun gameplay loop. Unlike the original, which I'll only play if I'm desperately bored, it is fun, but at the end of the day, it's a 2600 game. I'm not gonna go back to it. <laughs> I can actually see myself coming back to this one. There's also a bunch of missions with harder co-tile formations, three difficulty modifiers from the main game, and four player simultaneous multiplayer. There's even a way to beat the arcade mode. I mean, there's no real ending, and it takes about an hour long run, so I haven't done it yet. There's just too many games that came out. I don't have the time. But the game is fun enough where I, I will complete it at some point. And all the missions. I mean, I have most of the achievements already just by playing the game. I may as well, right? So yeah, if you're looking for a fun arcade twin stick shooter, Yars Recharged has you covered. This is the first game on this list that I would really recommend to everyone, especially if you have friends. Disclaimer, I did not play the multiplayer mode, so I don't know how accurate the last statement At last we come to the most recent game of the series, Yars Rising, released way back on September 10th, 2024. A long time ago, I know, right? It was so hard having all- I know I've talked about this before, but it was so hard having all three of these games come out within four days of each other. I still haven't been able to finish What the Car, and that was one of the ones I was most excited for. Anyway, since I've been showing nothing but this image the whole video, you're probably wondering what exactly this game is. This is a stealth action metroidvania developed by WayForward, where the original Yars Revenge gameplay shows up as hacking minigames. Now, if you know what those words mean, like, I probably don't even need to tell you anything else. You're already sold, but just in case, let me go in a little more detail. Before we get to that, though, please consider subscribing to the channel if you're enjoying so far. What's that? No, I'm totally not... I'm totally not recording this right now, uh, like a week later when I'm editing the video because I realized I forgot to do the sub promo. That would be crazy. First of all, I'd like to apologize that the footage here looks a little blurry. I had to lower the resolution to get lag free gaming on my laptop that only has 8 gigabytes of RAM. Also, for whatever reason, the comic book cutscenes really hate OBS, so I won't be showing those off. If there's any frame drops in the video, that's why it's because it's my laptop, but just know that it was a pretty smooth gaming experience even on this low-end hardware. So you play as Emi Kimura, whose online handle is Yar. She's performing a hacking job for a client, which requires her to upload this mysterious yarm, Yar on her arm that she doesn't know if it's a birthmark or a tattoo. That That's weird, what? But then she gets captured. While in her cell, she finds this big terminal, and after hacking it, is that the cheeky chase composer? No way! She gains the mysterious power to shoot energy out of her arm. From there, she has to escape Kotek, and eventually save the world, but that's far off at this point. Your gut reaction may be that this is another bad plot remake akin to the 2011 game, or it throws out the previously established canon and turns the bug into a person. No, it's not, trust me. I'd actually argue that the 2011 game wasn't entirely lore inaccurate, but regardless, it was certainly too much of a departure for many, including myself. But this isn't like that, trust me. It just respects the world building from the first game and feels right at home in the series. That's why this boxer might make you believe. This is not what the Yars look like in game. Their design is extremely faithful. The actual plot of this game is just okay. The twist villain in particular is probably the worst I've seen in any form of fiction. The performances are very good though. This game does a crazy thing. Emmy often makes jokes about the level design ahead of her, like a lot of annoying platform mascots too. But in this game, the jokes actually land. Um, yes, I'd like to buy 500 lasers, sir. Do you have a coupon for that, ma'am? Uh, you bet I do. Insane. Anyway, now that that's settled, how does the game play? It's good, controls are tight. The stealth sections do get pretty annoying, though, and there aren't many unique mechanics. I was also disappointed with the lack of movement upgrades you get to go faster. 
There is a there is a dash move you unlock, but it is so much end lag, it's not even worth it unless you equip the biohack. Before I get to that though, let me talk about the hacking minigames. So as I mentioned, the hacking minigames here are a return to the classic Yards formula. But thankfully, it doesn't stop with the base mechanics found in that game. There's a ton of variety here, like cells that can only be broken by the cannon, keys to collect that remove cells' defenses, even references to other Atari games like Black Widow and Centipede. Dude, you get to play Missile Command, but you're the one bombing the cities now. That's so cool! There's a bunch of Atari references in the main game, too, like the city's name being referenced to the original name for Atari Corporation, or the save terminals being modeled after Computer Space, the first game Atari ever made, even before Pong. And the bosses are often based on the Atari references that the hacking minigames of the area were based on. It doesn't really make sense to have a spider boss in a facility where they focus on experimenting with fly people, but whatever. And these hacking minigames actually get really hard late game. They do not hold back. It's pretty refreshing, actually. There's an invincibility toggle for them if you're not gamer enough and don't really care about the hacking, which I would understand. There are three things you'll be doing hacking to do to deactivate a stage hazard, like opening a door or shutting down lasers, to get the main upgrades of the game, called augments, and to unlock the biohacks. These are similar to badges in other games. You equip a certain amount of them, and they give you several passive buffs. However, I feel like there are a lot that should have just been permanent. Like, the only way to upgrade your health or ammo capacity is to use these biohacks, and they take up the space you could use for other things. Like, I want my damage stat to scale with the higher level of enemies this game throws at me, but now I don't have any room to crawl faster. So I know there's a lot of crawling in this game, and it's very irritating how slow the base speed is. So, fun fact, you may notice that there are shot speed and damage biohacks for your gun, but no fire rate biohacks. Oh, why is that? It's because there is no fire rate cap. You can shoot as fast as you can mash. This is a very weird decision. Like, I annihilated the final boss by mashing. They probably shouldn't have done it like this. That really wasn't a good point to transition to a conclusion from, but in conclusion, this game slaps. The actual platformer gameplay might be a little basic, and the lack of movement upgrades is disappointing, to say the least. But it wholeheartedly makes up for it in its charm. After playing all the previous games researching the lore, plus playing the arcade timeline in Atari 50, it was, inc it was an incredibly rewarding experience. I always had trouble putting it down during my playthrough. It almost affected my studies. Almost. Don't worry, I'm, I'm still doing my homework. And not to mention, the OST is also extremely good. Like, right after you get the blaster and essentially complete the tutorial, the game immediately hits you with... How do you 